19, 1980, classified as a first offender, offense, second degree murder, sentencing date, January 27, 1998, but re-sentenced in August 15, 2016, sentenced to life. Parole date is December 30th, 2021. Good time is none. Full term is life. Is this information correct, sir? I didn't, I could. Yes. Let me see. Okay. Mr. Roche. Can you hear him now talking? I can hear him now. It's, it's getting... Thank you, Ms. Teresa. Can you hear me, Mr. Keith? Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Keith. How are you? Good morning, you. I'm fine. Good. Uh, members of the panel, Mr. Keith is a juvenile lifer. He was sentenced uh, in a second degree murder case to life without benefits. Because of the Supreme Court um, case of Miller uh, in Louisiana, case of Montgomery and an act of the state legislature, he became eligible for parole after 25 years of uh, serving, 25 years, after, became eligible for parole after 25 years of his sentence. He's a first felony offender. This was his only arrest and he has no supervision history. Uh, I've read uh, his mental health evaluation, which is a requirement in juvenile lifers cases. And it was a good mental health evaluation, no issues at the time. And the author of the evaluation said that he should perform very well if and when he's ever released. He has a low risk assessment. He's earned his GED and uh, while he's incarcerated, have you done any other advancement towards your education since you received the GED? Yes, sir. I've completed carpentry school. Okay, good. You have a trade, good. Yes, sir. Uh, the programs uh, that he's completed, personal development, problem solving, anger management, money management, victim awareness and restitution, employment skills, 100 hours pre-release, inside out dad, living in balance parts one and two, are there any other programs that you would like to mention? Yes, sir. I'm currently attending. Thank you for a change. You're currently enrolled? Yes, sir. Good. Excellent course. What have you got from Thank You For A Change so far? Thank You For A Change has helped me develop better social skills and to talk to people and let them talk and understand where they come from and give them information and receive information back so we can help each other. Okay. It's all it's all, all about changing your mindset and changing the way you do things. Yes, sir. What is your job at uh, Louisiana State Penitentiary? I'm currently a compound orderly for the rodeo ground. And okay. I paint and cut grass and whatever else they need me to do, I do it. So actually sort of like a maintenance man. Yes, sir. Okay. Are you a trustee? No, sir, I'm not. Okay. Tell us what your transition plan if you are released. Where will you work and where will you live? Okay. I'm looking to go for the parole project. For the transition. Okay. And I'm almost sure Mr. Huntley will outline the uh, transition plan that he has set up for you at the time uh, later on in this interview. 
I see you have a, a vocational skill. Um, so let's talk about drugs and alcohol. You were 16 at the time of this offense. Had you started using drugs and alcohol? No, sir. Have you ever used drugs and alcohol? Yes, I have before, yes, sir. Under okay. peer pressure. So was it before your offense or after? Oh, it was way before my offense. Okay, so at what age did you start using drugs? I've never used drugs. I was drinking. I drink alcohol from time to, you know, partying with friends and stuff on the weekend. That's it. Oh, were you? So let's get the record straight. You have never used drugs. No, sir. At what age did you start using alcohol? I was about 15 years old. And alcohol did not play a part. No, sir. Drugs, no alcohol played a part. So Mr. Mr. Irish just convinced you to go along with him. No, sir, he did not. Then, then why did you uh, take the, uh, the firearm from him and he suggested that you shoot first? Why did you do that? I refused. You refused? Yes, so, sir. So, so you, didn't, you didn't shoot the victim? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Okay. I was held at gunpoint and told her I better shoot. Okay. That part was not in the report. Okay, let's continue. What community service have you rendered to your fellow offenders while incarcerated? Community service? Yeah. I've never been a part of a, a club or anything since I've been in Angola, but I've helped offenders go to and from child that are in wheelchairs that cannot walk or have anybody else push them down there. I've assisted them with that. Okay. Uh, if anybody's needed help, friends, I've always been quick to give them a hand and help them any way I can. So you you've not worked in a toy shop, you've not worked with the Point Lookout Project or any organized community service project. No, sir. Okay. This is stuff I've done on my own free will. Good. And, and that counts a little bit more. Then, then, then organize. You do it because it's the right thing to do. Yes, sir. Um, opposition, opposition, in this case, comes from the entire legal community. The sentencing judge, the DA's office, the Cato Parish Sheriff's office and the chief of police of, of Shreveport, Louisiana. We have opposition from the victim's son, Mr. Matthew Rowan, Ms. Kathy Rowan Walker, the victim's wife at the time he was murdered, Emily Rowan Culp, his daughter, Lydia Rowan, his sister, and there's 13 additional letters from family, friend, clergy, and most important, the community at large, people within the community that knew the victim or the victim's family has sent letters opposing your early release. Um, I think you also have letters of support from your aunt and your girlfriend. Um, I'm going to tell you very frankly, Mr. Keith, I have a major concern about your rehabilitation in your maturity. And I'm gonna tell you what my concern is. Your general disciplinary conduct 
over the last 10 years has been less than desirable. Uh, we had 13 write-ups in the last 10 years. You have over 60 disciplinary write-ups in your 24 years of incarceration. You've been either in the working cell block or segregated quarters or change in security level four times in the last five years. You've been in the working cell block or segregated quarters 14 times during your incarceration. You have five or six write-ups for sex offenses. Your last disciplinary write-up on August 20, 2019, which is less than two years ago, was a 21C for a sex offense. 13, 13 of their disciplinary write-ups were between the age of 30 and 40 years old. Most experts say that a male child, this is psychological, social workers, medical experts say that a male child matures around the ages of 20, seven and 30 years of age. That's fully mature. It takes us a little longer than our female counterparts come to the re realization that we have to act as an adult. But between the ages of 30, after you should have reached full maturity, you had 13 disciplinary write-ups. And some of those are very serious write-ups. You've been sent to the working cell block during that period of 30 and 40, which shows a lack of maturity and a lack of rehabilitation. And the courts say that when a parole panel is considering parole for a juvenile lifer, it is to look for maturity a certain level of maturity and a level of rehabilitation. I don't see either today, simply because of your disciplinary uh, conduct. Often when I see a juvenile rifle, I'd like to see three to five to six years where there's no disciplinary write-ups where there's excellent programs, where there's excellent community service, to show that you've reached a level of rehabilitation that you realize that it's not all about yourself, it's about helping individuals. It's about following rules and regulations, not breaking them uh, after over 20 years of incarceration. Your last write-up was less than two years, years ago. You've been incarcerated for 24 years. You should know the rules and regulation. And if you had reached that level of maturity, you would know better. So it's a major concern for me. Warren Hooper, would you like to make any comments, remarks, observations at this time? Yes, um, just to piggyback on what you're saying, he uh, has a total of 58 disciplinary reports. And it well, just, yeah. well, you have a couple of doubles in there, and I, I count the doubles as two. Okay. But, uh, so basically, it looks like he's closed down with his write-ups in 2015. Um, picks up four since 2015. Uh, he did receive his GED in April 29th of 2005, so he got that early on. He's completed his 100 hours, um, and he does have a low Tiger score, so just for the board's information. 
Thank you, Orton. Um, Mr. Reese, that completes my presentation. Thank you. Ms. Jackson? Yes, Mrs. Keith. Um, you were in court in Caddo on August 15th of 2016, appearing before Judge Ramona Emanuel. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And the purpose of that appearance was for her to determine whether or not you should be granted uh, eligibility for parole as a juvenile lifer. Do you remember that uh, court appearance? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember the behavior that you demonstrated at that court appearance? Was the attorney? Yes, ma'am. And uh, there's a transcript or an excerpt of a transcript that was submitted by um, one of the individuals opposing your receiving parole. Uh, Mr. Gowens, that's that was your attorney, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. After Judge Emanuel made her ruling, Mr. Gowen says, and we'll find a, we, and we'll file appropriate motions for appeal and designation of the record, Your Honor, and the court duly noted. Defendant, what? Appeal it. Man, you ain't never seen me. You've never answered my letters or nothing. How are you going to appeal it for me? Mr. Goins, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Defendant, full of shit, man. You're full of shit. The court, I'm not going to tolerate that language, Mr. Keith. How would you respond to that, uh, that behavior, uh, Mr. Keith? I was out of line. I was angry. I was upset because I've never seen that man before in my life. Well, but Mr. Keith, do, can you understand how that's a cause of concern for us that you're even in that setting, even in that environment, even when you're appearing before a judge who has the power to decide whether or not you even get to the point that you are right now, your response is to be unable to control your anger and your temper and you lash out at the attorney who is making every effort to help you. And obviously he did help you because the judge did see fit to give you the opportunity to have this day. And you use profanity towards him and in the presence of the court. You know, I understand that when you're 16, you're immature, you're impulsive, you don't think ahead, you don't truly understand the magnitude of your actions. But in 2016, Mr. Keith, you should have acquired that level of maturity uh, that would have prevented you from responding in this way. I mean, that's very troubling to me. So uh, really, that, that, that's all I have, Mr. Roche. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Teresa? Thank you. OK, we will now hear from our participants. Can we please hear from Andrew Hunley first? Thank you, Andrew Hunley with Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, here to let the board know today that uh, if you would choose to grant Audie Keith his request for parole, uh, parole project uh, would be willing uh, to have Audie in our reentry program. As you are aware, uh, Louisiana Parole Project uh, has served now uh, 200 clients uh, through, um, uh, th through our reentry program. We have a very positive success rate, as, especially as it relates to juvenile lifers. Uh, and based on Aldi's low risk Tiger score, 
uh, we feel like he would uh, not be an individual who would be at risk for uh, recidivating. Would like to also mention that Louisiana Parole Project would be willing to provide all the long-term reentry support in light of uh, the community's uh, attitudes towards Aldi in the Caddo area. We recognize that this board may choose if they were willing to grant him that he may not, uh, they, the board may not see fit for him to return to that area. I'm just letting you know that we would work with Aldi to ensure that he had long-term uh, residence uh, in an area he could be successful if that's what the board chose. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Now, can we please hear from Ms. Connie, who's the mother? Yes. Um, I'm Audie Keith's mother. My name is Connie Nowlin and he has all his family support, his siblings, um, nieces, nephews, his grandmother who is very ill with Alzheimer and also is a dialysis patient. And um, she actually helped raise him as a child. And um, we don't want to have her around much longer. So we were hoping that the board would see fit to um, allow Audie to go home or come home and join the reentry program with Andrew Huntley. Thank you. Now, can we please hear from Ms. Rhonda, who is the fiance? Yes, my name is Rhonda Laughlin and I'm his fiance. Um, I had submitted a request um, and let everyone know that um, I would do my best to my ability to help rehabilitate him um, if y'all would let him be released um, and go through any program he needed to to help him along the way and reestablish his um, life in society. Um, he is a good man um, as much as I've known him uh, since we have been together and before even being friends, um, I've seen a tremendous change in him and um, I would be very honored if y'all would grant him his parole. Ms. Laughlin, we do have your letter. Thank you. Now, can we please hear from Ms. Tracy, who's an aunt? Good morning, yes. I, first of all, I want to thank Mr. Roche and Ms. Jackson for the concerns that they shared with all of us today. Um, simply put, I am asking for an extension of grace today. I do believe that, as Mr. Roche mentioned, that it took him longer to mature, much longer to mature than most people, most men. But I believe today, that all of this, that all of that, if he were to be granted parole today, that upon his time of working up until his release date, that a lot of great and good things would continue to happen for him. And I, I believe that he has shown that he can be productive in society, even though it has been a number of years that he has been incarcerated. But I have a lot of faith in God. I have a lot of faith in my nephew as a person. And that's just the kind of person that I am. I have a lot of hope and a lot of faith. So I am asking that he be granted parole today. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's hear from opposition. Can we please hear from Ms. Linda, who's the victim's sister? Yes, thank you for carefully reviewing this case and reading the numerous letters and emails that were written by our friends and family hoping to prevent 
the uh, release of Audie Keith. I want to share this photo with you. This shows Russ with his 11 year old son, Matt, the day before he was senselessly murdered. Russ thought he was creating memories for his son of a first hunting trip. What Russ couldn't know is this would be the first and last hunting trip with Matt. While Russ was teaching Matt gun safety and that shooting a gun at a living creature would result in harm or death to that creature, Audie Keith was participating in the planning of a robbery and murder of a man he didn't even know. Audie knew the morning of December 30th that he was going to help his friends in their plan to rob and kill Russ. Audie had nothing to gain from this act. He could have backed out on two different occasions, but he chose not to. Earlier that morning, Russ was called to collect back rent for the mobile home that Russ purchased for Audie's accomplice in this crime. While at the trailer, Audie and his friends visited with Russ and his son about the previous deer hunt. Then they lied about the reason that they lured him there. As the day progressed, Audie and his friends revisited their early failed plan to rob and kill Russ. Audie was still a willing participant in what was to come. Russ never expected to become their prey. He was lured to the trailer for a second time, only after firing a bullet through the body of my brother and stealing the money from his truck for his friends, Audie decided that he no longer wanted to be a part of this horrific scheme. Audie not only took the life of my only sibling, the only son of my aged mother, he took the father and grandfather from his daughter, Emily, and his son, Matt, and their two beautiful families. This is Matt and his beautiful family. This is Emily and her beautiful family. Audie is thriving in Angola prison. He has a Facebook page where he describes himself as a cool, down-to-earth person that treats others with respect. Russ, on the other hand, took a bullet to his face. This is a copy of the picture of the Facebook page. I hope that you, the parole board, never have to feel the grief that our family has endured. And I hope that you never experience a tragedy like this. I beg that you deny Audie Keith the opportunity to inflict this pain on anyone else. Please support the original sentence of life without benefit of parole, which was promised to our family and friends. Thank you. Miss Lydia. Uh, Ms. Linda, we did get all of your letters from each one of your family members, and they were read in their entirety. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Teresa? Thank you. Now, can we please hear from Mr. Ball, who's the victim's friend? Yes, uh, I've known Russ from birth and went through school with him and each other's weddings. Um, he left, went to the Marine Corps, was a U.S. Marine, came back. We worked together at KCS Railroad and both went out and went into business for ourselves. Russ was at a thriving business that was growing and a very, you know, productive member of society, as they say, as a taxpayer and everything. This was a census killing, but I did not hear from Audie was that uh, a humble and contrite man that is now a Bible-believing Christian participating in Bible study. And what I heard was excuses of peer pressure, 
you know, the devil made me do it mentality rather than taking responsibility for what you did and apologizing for it and being contrite about it. So I do not think he needs to be released. Uh, at this point, he would be worse than he was. So I ask the parole board to deny parole and continue with the life sentence. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that is all the participants that would like to speak. Mr. Key, would you like to make a brief statement before the board votes? Yes, ma'am, I would. I'd like to take this time and say that I'm sorry again for what happened all those years ago when I did do it. Yes, no, I wasn't an active participant in it, and I was forced into doing it. That's why I, that I realized that what happened during that time, that it was wrong that happened, and I took responsibility for what happened during that time. That's why I pled guilty to the crime in 1998, and I was the star witness for the state to help convict my co-defendant for him to be placed on death row. Thank you, Mr. Keith. Is the panel ready to vote? This case was assigned to me, so I will be the lead vote. Mr. Keith. Yes, sir. After reading all the information that was at my disposal, I've come up with the um, idea of First of all, that the level of maturity we are looking for today, you have not reached that level of maturity. You've had 13 disciplinary right ups in the last 10 years. You have a 21C less than two years ago. Ideally, I would like to see a, a record of no disciplinary write ups for at least three to five years in these uh, long-term uh, sentencing cases to show me that you, you have reached a level of rehabilitation that you know the difference between right and wrong. Uh, so the level of maturity we're looking for, I did not find. The level of rehabilitation is not there along with the express opposition from the entire legal community, the judge, the DA's office, the sheriff's office, and the chief of police, along with the victim's family, who is adamantly opposed to any uh, early release. We have opposition from the community at large. Therefore, my vote today is to deny your request based upon all the information I've just articulated. Mr. Wise. Yes, sir, thank you very much. Uh, you know, in this case here, I, I sat and I went over this case for a long time and I looked at the case and I agree with Mr. Roche. You know, one of the things I see you had 521s sex offenses in your jacket. Also, um, your DB reports in 2029. There's a time, you know, we see people all the time. I've been on this board almost uh, 18 years. And I see these people come before us. When they come before us, I've seen them just like you. Uh, I think Mr. Hunley may have been one of them. His uh, disciplinary write-ups was, he didn't have a lot of disciplinary write-ups. You need to get in there. And they was talking about the Facebook page and things like that. I see where you've had other write-ups, like uh, I, I just, just to go over uh, aggravated disobedience, you had 21 of those in your jacket. Get a hold of this thing, work on it. Today, my vote is to deny. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Thank Mrs. You. Jack. Uh, Mr. Keith, um, I concur with my fellow board members. 
uh, with respect to the number of disciplinary actions that you've um, accumulated the fact that as recently as 2019, there, uh, there was a write-up for a sex offense. I don't find that you've uh, engaged in a lot of programs that would uh, not only benefit you, but benefit others within the institution. And there's intense family, community, and law enforcement opposition. But what I would say, um, as I read the victim opposition letters, even though they were opposed, I saw that there was an opportunity for grace if you had just changed, if you had just become a better person. There's something in me that says hearts could have been softened if they had seen anything in you that indicated that you had truly, truly uh, been remorseful for your actions, if you had spent all this time working to better yourself and to help others, there might have been a softening in their attitudes towards you. But I think what's really gotten to them, in addition to the crime itself, is the fact that you don't seem to have learned very much. You, you, you don't seem to have grown up or matured as evidenced by that outburst in court in 2016. No contrition, no humility, no true empathy for what you did in this case. And so my you know, request of you is to look inward at yourself. Don't blame anybody on the screen for the decision today. Look inward at yourself and, and figure out what it is that you need to truly change. Because, you know, right now, I just don't think you're where you need to be. And for those reasons, I also will deny your request. Thank you, Mrs. Mr. Keith. You have received three votes to deny your request for early release. You have gotten statements and comments and advice and just uh, good information from all three members of the panel. It is live up to you whether you take that advice or not, but you know what you have to do and maybe, maybe next time it may be different if you uh, change your mindset. So our decision today is to deny your request. This concludes this hearing. That's it. Come on. Mr. Roche, I believe that is the last case at Angola. Can we please close out? Thank you, Mr. Reese. Juan Hooper. Yes, sir. Thank you for your assistance. It's nice seeing you. We're going to stand and join at Louisiana State Penitentiary. It is 9 48 a.m. Thank y'all. Where does one even start with this hearing? This guy, you see him sitting there like emotionless. And you're just saying, what is wrong with him? But you know what's the, the, I think to be hilarious or just, <laughs> I'm sorry, but we just saw this hearing, right? Even I felt his family members were aware or not in denial that he needs a lot of work. I mean, one of them said, let us get him help on the outside. And the other is like, yeah, he's not really mature, but you know, it's, it, they were trying, but they weren't in denial, I don't think. And yet, we have two professionals. We have the low risk score, and we have the therapist who said that the mental health evaluation, who said that he would fell, perform well on the outside if released. 
I'm real glad that the DOC is paying these PhDs to tell us things that make absolutely no sense. Low risk score. Okay. Then the next thing that we can get out of the way, because I know that many of you might be wondering, and that is, what is a 21C? Well, 21C is a sex offense. There's A, there's B, there's C. Now, C is sexual misconduct, offender on offender, contact or attempted contact between, you know, you can read the rest for yourself. Now, it's not a B, which would be abusive, which would be um, offender on offender, but where it's, sorry, it would not be A, which is non-consensual. So it's C. It's the least, um, it's the least, I guess, bad uh, sex offense. But I mean, obviously that's whatever. Um, you know, he was 16 when he committed this crime. And we can go over the information that Richard provided about his crime. And it is just brutal. It is so brutal. And we find out, and it's always like the good ones get taken. We find this is a father. He's an ex-Marine. He just went on his first and last hunting trip with his son. An entrepreneur, just really a good guy. And these punks, these little punks, take his life, and they take his life in a brutal way. And he sits here and he says, I testified against my co-defendants. And it's like, okay, you, you're, okay, you want a cookie? Like, it, it's hard to imagine. I love how Miss Jackson came, came down and, and just like ripped him a new one for what he did, which is recent. He's not a young guy. He's been locked up a long time. He's, 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 to, to go and start yelling at the attorney in front of the judge. What's amazing to me is that even after that outburst, even after that outburst, a judge still says that he should get a right for parole, which I guess maybe it's just out of their control. I don't know what the, the federal ruling because he was a child and due process and blah, blah, blah. But man, I mean, it is clear if there's any from any hearing that we have seen, I think this one is clear that this punk is is not ready to be on the outside i mean imagine what it would happen to him on the outside how quickly he would probably get relocked up the it's it's it, if anything it can show us and give us some appreciation for what a proper conduct record looks like and i think i'll play a hearing after this where we do see a glimpse of what a product proper conduct record looks like. Although I'm, I watched it before I watched this one. So my commentary might not line up exactly. So keep that in mind, but, uh, because I got pretty upset, but not at the inmate as much as I got upset at, at the board and how they handled the case. Um, so, okay, let's share this tab. On the morning of December 30th, 1996. December 30th, 1996. Petitioner Daniel Irish telephoned Russ Roland, his landlord, and told Roland that he had $500 of the back rent that he owed him. Little did Roland know that Irish had been talking for several days about how he intended to rob and kill someone. Someone who had a lot of money. And he had settled on Roland as the victim. When Roland arrived at the trailer early that morning, however, Irish did not follow through with his plan. Instead, he told him that the checkbook had gone missing and, and, and to come back. Um, can you imagine all of this over $500? One month's rent? Are you kidding me? Pathetic. 
Later that day, Irish, his girlfriend, Christy Klein, and friends, Adi Keith and Jason, drove to the local Walmart store. All four young people lived in the same trailer park and had been hanging out together for a few months since Irish's mother and stepfather had moved out of town. Klein had been living with Irish in the trailer, which was without phone service. On the way back from Walmart, Irish again began to talk about how he needed money and that he should rob and kill someone to get it. What a brilliant guy. He's going to rob and kill someone. Wow, you're so smart. Now, remember, this is not this is not who we just saw. This is his co-defendant who we probably testified against, right? Irish driving Klein's car stopped at a convenience store and used the payphone to call Roland's office again. So he's like, he decided, okay, you know what? We'll, we'll do it this time. We'll get him to come back. We'll get him to come back. Um. He left a message with Roland's secretary. He had what Russ needed. And if Roland would come by, he'd take care of him. Look at that. He 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 actually thinks, you can see the words he used, he'd take care of him. He actually thinks he's being like, you know, oh, I'll take care of him. It, it, it's such a senseless, ridiculous crime that you zero chance of getting away with. The whole thing is so absurd. And that's what they say. Well, that's exactly why they should get a different chance. They were young and their brains aren't working. And it's like, yeah, but no, it means you fall under like the one zero point one percent of the one percent or whatever the math is of people who don't who just shouldn't. You know, it's it's not it doesn't. And, and he claims he, 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 he was sober. I know this is a different guy, but we'll get up to him. Keith comes into the picture now. Irish Klein and Keith waited at Irish's trailer um, home for Russ to arrive. They didn't have to wait long. When Roland arrived around 3 p.m., Adi Keith was sitting in a chair in the living room. And as Roland stepped to open the door, Keith, this prince who we just saw, he fired a blast from his 12 gauge shotgun hitting this Marine, this dad, this husband, this entrepreneur, this son. He hit him with a 12-gauge shotgun, point blank. You think this 16-year-old should get out? You think he has a low risk score? You think he has a high chance of succeeding? He hits him in the abdomen, which you can only imagine is is, is got to be the most utterly painful the extreme pain they say they say abdominal shots stomach shots are just brutal he collapses on the wooden porch outside the front door irish took the shotgun and attempted to fire it so now the second guy takes it who needed his rent money he but it had misloaded and would not fire so then irish picked up his 30 30 rifle his 30 out 30 while roland was begging for his life so these punks, they got a shotgun, they got a 30 out 30. They can't they can't bring it to the pawn shop to pay for their rent. No, no, instead go ahead and murder this guy. While he's begging for his life, they stepped up to the door and fired the rifle down his right eye, blowing away a large portion of his head. Then appellants sent Keith out to the truck to look for Roland's wallet, which contained less than $200. Wow, you guys are just real brilliant, huh? He, he took the wallet and the money from Keith and put them under the cushion of his love seat. Keith, now sitting at the table with his head in his hands, refused to help Iris drag the body to the trailer. What's interesting here is that it does seem to show something. Like he's not... Like he's in shock, he's he's in remorse, he's, you know, it affected him, right? But Klein, who had hidden in the bedroom, emerged and began cleaning up the blood and the carpet where Irish had dragged Roland's body down the hallway. Jason had seen Roland's truck drive by, uh, heard two shots and came over to see what had happened. Gwyn noticed that the front porch was not wet and that the, uh, the front porch was now wet and that there was a big black mark like a trail going down the hall. He saw Klein on his knees scrubbing at the black mark. Gwyn asked where Irish uh, was, and Keith pointed out to the to the 
back, Gwen walked down the hall and saw Roland's body on the floor and Irish emerging from the bathroom. When Irish asked him to help him with the body, Gwen couldn't speak. He saw Irish pick up the shotgun and begin to load it. Then Gwen saw a sheriff's car entering the subdivision. Wow, these guys, these guys really lasted long, huh? They really got away with this, huh? When Irish turned towards Gwen with the shotgun, Gwen ran out the back door and into the wooded area behind the trailer, emerging at a neighbor's house and calling first his parole officer. Oh, he's on parole. Oh, that's great. That's just that's just fantastic. Then the sheriff's investigator, Hensley, whom he knew had um, and failing to reach them, he finally called 911 to report the murder. So, so um, who called 911? Gwen ran out the back door of the waiter behind the trailer, emerging near his house and calling. So Gwen was the one that was hiding. Who was Gwen again? I'm sorry. I just I want to. 3 p.m. Keith in the living room. Tied, put me slowed. Roland begged for his life. I'm sorry. Oh, God. Um, Klein hid in the bedroom. Who is. Who is Gwen? Later that day, his girlfriend, Christy Klein, and a friend, Audrey Keith and Jason Gwynn, drove to the local Walmart. Uh, Keith, now sitting at the table with his head, uh, began his blood carpet. Irish had dragged Roland's body to the hallway. Jason Gwynn had seen Roland's truck drive by, heard two shots, and came. Oh, okay. So he wasn't there. He just saw the truck and heard shots. He came in. Um, to see what happened, and that's when he noticed what was going on. Okay, so he, he he didn't want any piece of it. He called his parole officer. He called the cops. So good for him. Good for him. These idiots. They really like. We owe our landlord rent. Well, let's kill him, and we won't have to pay rent. He just can't make it up, man. Wow. Um, he called 911. Keith Klein and Irish tune left as well. Keith going over to another neighbor's house until his parents delivered him to authorities. And Irish and Klein leaving in the car. Steve, uh, Demont, uh, local bondsman, sheriff deputies walked over to Irish's trailer and observed that a hose was running water by the front porch, which had been washed down. The deputy saw blood, tissue, and bone fragments, as well as a shotgun wadding around the porch area and on the ground. Roland's uh, white pickup truck was parked at the front of the trailer, but the trailer appeared unoccupied. And the deputies realized that the blood tissue and bone fragments might be human. They received information from the headquarters that reported the homicide. Investigators soon arrived and entered the unlocked back door of the trailer to see if anyone was injured inside finding his body. Um, and his wallet with $141 of cash were found under the cushion of the love seat. Freaking idiots. Roland's receipt book was also found in the trailer. A receipt was found made out to Danny for 500 of back rent. The self-carbon copy of the receipt was still on the book. Deputies had received a description of Klein's car. So when Irish drove back towards the trailer park around 6 p.m. to lock the back door, he was noticed by the deputies and taken into custody. Klein was picked up at Steve DeMonte's house and several statements of Klein. Irish maintained that Keith had fired both shots from the two different weapons. Irish maintain that Keith, so Irish is now saying that Keith is the one that fired both shots. Um, where he relates that Danny shot him in the chest. Klein later testified that she had not seen either shot fired. Keith, who first claimed that Irish had pulled the trigger of the 12 gauge as Keith only held it, testified at trial that he indeed fired the first shot but that Irish had forced him to do so at gunpoint, right? Okay. And that Irish had fired the rifle shot to Roland's head. 
At the time of the murder, Audrey Keith, who is mentally slow. Really? Is that, did he look mentally? I mean, it, what? Okay. At the time, Audrey Keith was mentally slow, was 16 years old. Christy Klein was 17 years old. And Daniel Irish was 18. Before Irish's trial, Audrey Keith pled guilty to second degree murder and was sentenced to life without benefit of parole. Christy Klein pled guilty to accessory after the fact of first degree and received a maximum sentence of five years at hard labor to run consecutive with one year she received his accessory burglary in an unrelated case. Well, she got away with murder, huh? Keith testified for the state during its case in chief and Klein testified that, I mean, she didn't, you know, it, I don't know what her full involvement was, right? It wasn't clear to me. If she should have gotten more than six years, I don't know. Daniel Irish was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to death on August 27th and August 28th, 1999, respectively. Uh, and he, he made it clear. I, I testified against him. You, you did hear him say that, right? And when you think about it, it's like, dude, you're being no hero by testifying against him, which we all know anyways, but you pulled the trigger. It was probably a fatal wound to begin with. And then you testified against him because you were going to face the death penalty otherwise. So it's just like, he is a pathetic loser. He's just a loser. Um, I would love to know uh, let me Google it and see if he's, if you have a list, what happens. He's for sure. Oh, who would have thought that sentence was reversed to Diney Irish was convicted of first degree and sentenced to death in Cato Parish, 1996, killing of his landlord when he was 18. His clemency application said IQ testing has shown that he was intellectually impaired to the degree that makes him ineligible for the death penalty. Irish was denied. I mean, you know, someone who does say, hmm. I should kill my landlord. You would assume that they had like a low IQ, but man. Um, okay. Irish was denied full clemency hearing Friday. He, he wanted a full clemency. Okay. Um, Aaron Nova, the attorney representing Irish issued the following statement. Danny Irish bears little resemblance to the teenager. He was in 1996. Today's proceeding was supposed to be a full clemency hearing at which Danny would have been able to speak directly to the board and answer its questions about its growth and redemption over the past 25 years. It's unconscionable that the board, on an evenly divided vote, has denied Danny the opportunity to present detailed evidence of the role his youth, trauma, and intellectual impairment played in his crime, as well as a transformation in his responsible, caring, trustworthy, and devout man deserving of mercy. Yes, it's unconscionable. That they would have to put the family through this. Really? Really? A full clemency? Are you nuts? What year is this? Oh my gosh, this is recent. Wait a minute. This is October 13, 2023. We probably, they probably, um, we could probably watch this exact hearing of the death row inmate. Yeah, we saw it. Ant Antoinette Frank. Let me see if we can pull this up. Holy cow. Yes. So I, I found it. Richard did have it in the notes. Um, on October 13th, for those of you who may be familiar, the, the governor uh, who was leaving Louisiana tried to pass basically something which was, you know, very controversial, which was giving the opportunity for, they want to give the opportunity for almost all death row inmates for the ability to have a hearing that would grant them the right to then have a commutation hearing that would take them off of death row. Now, this is very controversial because, um, 
it was like rushed. This this whole initiative was kind of rushed in. It was there's a lot of people on on each side of the aisle that were saying this is like unconscionable that you would do this and to put all the victims through this. And if you can imagine, a lot of these cases were just the worst of the worst. Um, we saw just we saw basically basic like serial killers that were um, gonna have the opportunity to get off of death row, and the a lot of the argument was look it's not about you know uh it's just about getting off the death row they're always going to be locked up in prison for life and the counter argument for anyone who knows anything about the louisiana uh, system is that's not true um it's you take someone off the death row and now you're at life you're one step closer to getting your sentence commuted We've seen it happen. And it's funny to hear the people who are pro, who are like, who are, you know, on the side of the death row inmates that, by the way, don't have execution dates. There's no like, it's not even about saving their life. It's really, it's just a strange argument because, um, anyways, I digress. Here is a hearing where he fit under, he, he had this docket. So we're going to see, it's a little bit different. We don't see him. This is a hearing to decide whether he would have a right to have a hearing um, to see if he should be taken off of death row. So we're probably going to see the same family talk again. And um, and then we'll see the, the people have to talk on his behalf. We, again, this is a different person. This is the co-defendant, the man who 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 had the kill shot, um, the final shot at, at Point Blank Range, the man who was older, the man who needed to rent money and who they claim was not um, mentally competent. So I kind of, let's just jump into this and then we can continue uh, from here. So with that, let's, let's go. The pardon board is called back to order. The time is uh, 1048. Uh, our next case is Mr. Daniel T. Irish, DOC number 399680, date of birth, February the 12th of 1978. He's a second class felony offender. Uh, he was sentenced on November the 4th of 1999 uh, for first degree murder, sentenced to death. Uh, we have a uh, speaking on his behalf today uh, or Kevin Reich, uh, his attorney, Jillian Ross, uh, attorney, uh, Linda Brasher, who will be speaking, Gerald Jackson, who will be speaking, James Lambert, who will be speaking, Pamela Clayton here in support, Rebecca Hudsmith in support. Uh, in opposition, we have Leon Fitzgerald, Zach Daniels, Suzanne Ellis, who will be speaking, Matthew Rowland, who will be speaking, Susanna Rowland, Joyce Bunton, Eloise Kuntz, no. Charlie. Incorrect. I'm sorry. Okay. Darlene Williams? Yes, no? No. no. Cynthia Elliott is here, no? Yeah. Okay. But not speaking. Correct. Uh, uh, you're right. Uh, Pat Patricia Stalson, not speaking. Yes. Robert Bunton speaking. David Henderson speaking. Not speaking. Linda Rowland. Linda Kathy Rowland, Rowland speaking. Walker speaking. Linda Rowland is speaking. Okay. Uh, sorry. Kathy Rowland Walker and Darlene Williams. I have speaking on behalf of the opposition, Linda Rowland, in this order, Linda Rowland, David Henderson, Bob Bunton, Kathy Rowland Walker, and Matthew Rowland. Is that correct? Correct. Your Honor, um, Aaron Noblad, I'm Mr. Axe's attorney. I'm speaking on his behalf. I think we had Kevin Rich speaking. Um, from Mr. No, I didn't. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I did. I, I missed your name, Mr. Novak. You are you're on the list. I, I just didn't call you out. I'm sorry. We we're having a little difficulty with the uh, with the part the, the parties on on each side here. So I think we're ready to go. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, we're ready to proceed. Mr. Novot, it's my understanding you wish to go first. Normally, the attorney sometimes goes last, but you wish to go first. Okay. Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Aaron Novot, and I represent Danny Irish. Before I talk about Danny, I want to acknowledge the victims in this case, who are for Olivia and Sam. You have suffered unimaginable pain. On Danny's behalf, I want to apologize for all the pain you have suffered with what I'm sure has been new, fresh pain you are feeling as the pregnancy process is unfolding. If Danny were here, he could express his deep remorse for the damage he has brought to your lives. He recognizes the reality is that there is nothing he can keep from your pain, and that words mean little under these circumstances. He recognizes the only path to any semblance of redemption for what he has done is to spend his life trying to be a better person, a kinder person. And to do whatever he can to make this a better world. Danny's daily reflections on Mr. Rowland are what inspire him to keep learning and searching for ways to be a positive force in the world, even while confined in a death row cell. Members of the board, I know you have read our clemency petition, and I'll re not repeat all the points we raised here, but I do want to speak on it briefly. Danny was just 18 years old at the time of his crime. The Supreme Court has decided that a person under 18 years old cannot forfeit his life, even if he takes the life of another. But the day someone turned 18, that changed. The line must be drawn somewhere, but Danny is an example of why that arbitrary line does not always track with human experience. Given the trauma he suffered while in utero, his neglectful and abusive upbringing, and his brain damage and intellectual impairments, Danny was mentally and emotionally closer to the level of a 14 or 15 year old child than an adult in 1996. That is not an excuse for his conduct, but it helps us reconcile how, now, how an out of control teenager involved in a murder can transform into the kind, thoughtful man that Danny is today. When Danny arrived on death row, he began to process what had happened his crime, his arrest, his trial, and conviction. Locked alone in his cell, Danny read the transcript from his trial to try and gain some understanding. He had missed many details, finding himself in a day as events unfolded around him during his trial. And he was shaken when he read that the prosecutor argued in closing, Danny is a cancer that you see cut out from society. The phrase stuck in his mind, Danny is a cancer. It stuck. But as he thought about his behavior and the crime that brought him to death row, Danny found himself agreeing with the prosecutor. He had to be It was a crossroad moment in Danny's life. He resolved that while he couldn't change what he had done, he could change who he was. Since that moment, Danny has dedicated himself to becoming the best person he can be. He has availed himself of every program available on the road, even when that meant taking classes shackled by his hands and feet, cradling a phone between his shoulder and cheek, as he gleaned what lessons he could from a trustee through a plexiglass window. He was one of the first on the road to seek out GED classes. He has made efforts to help those from childhoods like his, Donating to educational programs for disadvantaged youth because he recognizes the difference education can make in their lives. He has worked hard to build a relationship with Christ, as today's speakers will describe, and he has sought to be a resource to other inmates, providing what wisdom and mentorship he can to other men who are beginning the journey he has been on for 25 years. One need look no further than the letter that former death row guard Brian Brown wrote on Danny's behalf to see the impact Danny has made. Mr. Brown got to know Danny well through their day to day contents. He writes, I have so much confidence in Danny's behavior that I would move him into my home with my wife and children. This letter speaks volumes, not just because Mr. Brown felt such affection for Danny, but also because he felt a need to offer such a public affirmation of the kindness and humanity of one of his death row wards. Did an example of Danny's goodness being reflect back, reflected back at him by the kindness of another? Something that was ironically missing from his life before he went down that road. Mr. Brown's letters confirmed Danny will do well in general population, where there are a greater number of programs and vocational opportunities available to him, and where he can reach a greater number of fellow inmates. His granted clemency, his positive influence, and gift for mentorship will be an asset to the person. After I'm done speaking, you will hear from several others who will confirm the man that Danny Irish has become. I urge you to grant Danny a full hearing so you can also hear directly from him before you make a decision. If you do, you will get to know a man who realizes there is no way he can fully atone for his actions, but despite that reality, has committed his life to bring whatever light he can to the world. 
Thank you very much. You know, we're here from uh, Jim Lambert. Members of the board, retired trial attorney from Lafayette and involved in the prison ministry that Mr. Ryan and Fitzgerald spoke of since 2001 in Angola. I've been to numerous retreats and been innumerable meetings with uh, groups of men up there. I've known Danny Irish since 2018 when we were asked to put on a retreat in death row. We've been visiting with them weekly, some of our groups, since 2018. I've met Danny on numerous occasions. We've got to know each other. And I'm here because I'm telling you that Danny Irish, I count as a friend and as a brother in Christ. Whatever that means to you, whatever weight you decide, put on it. Know that. Danny Irish came to this retreat very discouraged, in my opinion, uh, spiritually. Uh, I don't know if he had any beliefs. I know that he wasn't committed to Jesus, to be a follower of Jesus. I know that. Gradually, as the days went on, it's a four-day retreat, you know, I saw some light come on in his eyes. And since that time, you know, on these numerous occasions I've been with him, I've seen this man grow. I'm not speaking to the damage he did. I think his attorney has said that very well. I will tell you, in my opinion, my belief, that if released into the general population, he would be an asset. And I don't have to tell you, as members of the board, I will speak to the victim. Life in Angola without parole is a hell of a sentence. And I've met many, many men up there with that sentence. So justice may be altered, but it will be done. And he will have the rest of his life to atone to God and to other men. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comments. Now we'll hear from oh. Linda Brasher. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Lindy Brasher. I'm currently Danny Irish's spiritual advisor. Not long after meeting Danny, another inmate told me a story um, of another inmate who was struggling with scripture one day. The inmate that was struggling with scripture is someone who church groups come and visit every now and again. And so they looked at this man and said, God will never forgive you. And here's that man this day sitting on the floor with his scriptures open. He's trying to discover if this is the truth or not, will God forgive me? And Danny noticed this man struggling and Danny stopped and helped him and continues to do so today. And this is a person who has now grown spiritually because of that. Um, oftentimes we see scripture play out in front of us. And I let the inmate who told me the story know, you just saw the good Samaritan in action. Danny and I eat oftentimes when I go to the throat. And when we sit, we'll study scripture. He always brings his Bible in. I bring mine in. We're ready to go. One day this story happened. Um, I looked at him and I said, Danny, we hear the word justice, but what does that term mean in relation to God? And he answered with a very mature Christian response. He said, justice is doing what God wills us to do. So I asked, well, what is God's will? He again replied with wisdom to love. Okay, Danny. So what does love require? He took a deep breath and he said, to seek and offer forgiveness, to seek and offer compassion, to seek and offer mercy. <clears throat> it was evident to me that Danny lives in God's word because scripture is filled with hidden meaning and only the Holy Spirit can open those meanings and they're embedded within scripture, but only a soul who is humble and devout can discover these meanings, these truths, because Again, they're opened by the Spirit. Only a humble soul knows the power of God's forgiveness, mercy, and love. 
Danny is such a soul because he has been forgiven through God's mercy and love. And so I now ask you all to please exercise real justice, which is the only justice, which is the true justice, which is God justice. And as Danny literally <coughs> stated and explained, um, justice is doing God's will by extending compassion and mercy. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Jay Jackson. Good morning. My name is Jay Jackson. I was a chaplain up in Angola for 22 years. First 17 was volunteer. For my last five, I was full time. I got a chance to meet Danny, I guess, about 15 years ago. So I was making rounds on the cell blocks, going from cell block to cell block to cell block, which I did about once a month. It was always interesting with Danny because he was always had a smile on his face. He was glad to see me. He was glad to engage in the conversation. Although the depths of our conversation going cell block to cell block was kind of small, I did get a chance to know Danny much, much better when he got involved in the Kairos retreat program, which I've spoken about in 2018. I happened to meet the chaplain that facilitated that week after week after week, and I did it for two and a half hours every Monday for two and a half years. And the 10 guys, interestingly enough, the 10 guys that were selected to be part of that program were actually selected by the wardens of death row. They chose 10 men who they felt deemed quality men who could participate and contribute to that program. So that says a lot about Danny as far as the wardens actually thought. Um, another thing I think is kind of interesting is that Danny got himself involved in self-help programs such as Kairos to help himself it was a genuine effort to help himself. It wasn't it wasn't signing up for a program because this will look good on my resume and if we ever get a hearing, this will look good. Because three or four or five years ago in 2018 when they signed up for this, there was no such thing as having an administration hearing for the possibility of clemency. So that kind of shows you that Danny took the initiative in himself to try and make himself a better person. One of the things I can always remember about Danny coming to class or the sessions each week was that Danny came well prepared. He contributed and he was very genuine. And um, so I just want to say real quickly that if Danny's given the opportunity for uh, clemency and going into the general population, he's got the ability and the skills to give hope, inspiration, and motivation to the men in the general population. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Now we hear from the opposition, Ms. Linda Rowan. My name is Linda Rowan. I'm Russell's uh, only sibling. He was my younger brother. These last few months have been hard on everyone. We appreciate the time that you, the board, has given to this case. We hope that you have taken the time to read the 60 plus letters opposing Danny's application. Danny Irish has never accepted responsibility for his crime or expressed any sorrow or remorse to us. Danny. He cares for no one but himself. And if you search his prison record, you'll, record, you'll see that he has had sentences for pornographic material and gambling frames. The 27 year emotional toll this family, this crime has taken on this family and on us became even more unrelenting on May 22nd when an unknown woman showed up unannounced at the home of Russ's daughter, Emily, this woman victimized Emily again, saying that she was a victim liaison between Danny Irish and her family, leading Emily to believe that Daniel would soon be getting a new trial. After misrepresenting facts to Emily, she called the rest of the family and re repeatedly to say that she would be coming to Streetport to talk to us. Uh, then we figured out what she was and we declined. <clears throat> However, she called last night. Russ's daughter will be 42, the same age Russ was when Daniel murdered him. 
Three of Russ's six grandchildren are now the ages that Matt, his son, and Emily were when Daniel ripped their dad from them. Our mother lost her only son when he was 42, and she grieved for him for 16 years of his life. Russ lost his life before he saw his two children grow up to be successful, hardworking adults who lived their lives and raised their beautiful children with the same values Russ passed on to them. I see a stop sign. I'm just going to stop, and I'm going to say that if you recommend clemency for Daniel Irish, he will be on the path to possible parole and release, which will be an unacceptable result, and it will only give him the opportunity to join his felon brother. Mr. David Robin, Mr. David Henderson. My name is David Henderson. I appreciate the hard work of the Lord. I wouldn't want your job. Gross Rollins was a friend of mine, former U.S. Marine, railroad worker, home builder, father of two fine children, a church goer. He is greatly missed by all who knew him. It greatly saddens me when I see his children and grandchildren who he has never seen and would be proud of them, such fine grandchildren who will never know what a good man he was. As board members, you are aware of the damage, the pain, the heartache that Danny Irish inflicted on the family and friends of Russ Rose. I, for one, greatly miss Russ. He was a good man, a good friend, and a hard worker. Those kind of people are hard to come by. Danny Irish destroyed one. I sat through his murder trial at no time did Danny Irish or his two helpers deny planning his murder, carrying it out. I was horrified at cold blooded disregard for human life. Danny Irish found guilty, sentenced to death. This person showed no remorse at any time. Sentence needs to be carried out is a danger to everyone. And may I add, five days before Danny murdered Russ, Russ invited him to come to church. Him, and he refused. So his newfound thank you, really thank you, thank you, sir. It's terrible. Mr. Bob Button. Good morning. My name is Robert. Uh, I'm a lifelong friend of Russ. We began elementary school together in the first grade. We graduated high school together from Northwood High School in 1962. Russ was a non confrontational person. My earliest member, members of Russ was that he always wanted to join the Marines. And after high school, our past departed uh, due to life choices. And upon hearing the, the murder of Russ Brogan, it was like a take it up. So I couldn't believe anybody would take such actions against such a man. A man that previously helped other people that owed rent to him to find jobs so that he could pay his bills. <laughs> and then to plot and plan and execute First degree premeditated murder involving other people telling them what he's going to do, his plan, how he's going to do it, and how he was going to dispose of the body. And it's no way you can justify that. I've heard the religious aspect of it from the other side, but I also like to bring up Exodus and Leviticus, if we're all Christian people here. God's law, God's law, simply in the forefront was life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So this time I'd like to remind everyone that 
Um, we need to follow God's law first and let God decide what happens to his soul. I hope and pray that we continue with the original sentencing of Daniel Irish. Thank you very much. Mr. So, Kathy Roland Walker. <laughs> Thank you. Russ Rowland was my husband. He was 42 on December the 30th, 1996, when Daniel Irish shot and killed him. His daughter was 14, a freshman in high school. His son, Matt, 11. The day of the shooting, day of the shooting Matt had, was in Russ's care. They had just returned from what became their final father son hunting trip. Daniel called Russ to pick up rent money. We have what you need, and we'll take care of it. He brought him to the house. Matt put on his shoes to go in with his dad in the pickup truck. I praise God that Matt changed his mind and did not go. Can you imagine if he'd been in that car and saw his dad shot? Our lives were forever changed the day Daniel killed Russ, all for $441 in his wallet. He also robbed Emily and Matt of a lifetime of their fatherly love. He was not able to see the military recognition his graduation, walk his daughter down the aisle. He was not able to share his son's success, his graduation jobs, he and all that stuff. Russ missed out on critical years and opportunities to influence his children. Russ now also now has six beautiful grandchildren that will never go. Being a single working parent during my children's teenage years was not easy emotionally or financially, but I'm proud our children always maintain jobs to supplement income as needed. I'm proud that I taught my children that we must work for what they have. Clearly, that is not what Daniel thought. As a history of robberies. Russ served his country in the Marines. He began a life of working hard and building his family. He held down multiple jobs at a time, became a realtor, a home builder, and invested in some real property in order to provide for his family. He was a talented craftsman, enjoyed hunting, fishing, and people. Russ contributed positively to his community. He helped those less fortunate. He had many friends. He made people laugh and was a Christian. Daniel placed a gun directly to Russ's face. He, Russ was looking at him, screaming in pain and pleading for his life and asking Daniel not to shoot. Daniel showed him no mercy. I wonder if Daniel ever has nightmares about victims or sees that moment because I see it often and it's very disturbing. He deserves no leniency for the protection of others and this is why the president of the justice system and he gives them. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Matthew Rowland. Mr. Matthew Rowland on Zoom. Mr. Rowland, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. I apologize, and you'll have to bear with me. This is the first time I've publicly spoken about this since I was 11. But, um, you know, as of late, I've been thinking, you know, about my dad's last moments, The uh, as my mom said, with you know, Danny putting the gun to my father's eye and pulling the trigger. Um, my son, my firstborn, will be 11 in two weeks. And that was the age I was. And um, I can't imagine what my dad went through or what went through my father's eyes and mind when Danny put that gun to his head. I can't imagine leaving my son. And I just can't explain to you guys what this has done to me through my entire life, you know, I, there's something within that man that no matter what scripture he reads, no matter what solemn thoughts he has in his cell, it doesn't go away. That's between him and God. And at one point I would like to have a board or a nonprofit organization fight for the victims, the way they fight to get this man off the death row. We want to be done with this. We want the execution carried out so that we can get on with our lives and quit having to relive this every time somebody gets a, a hair to prove a point or get a political position. We want to be done with this. Please get this man out of our lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Ellis. Good morning. I'm Suzanne Ellis, who is of Louisiana in the parish of Cato, and I would like to start off by thanking the for this unprecedented opportunity to address you this day to the proceedings. I appreciate it. 
Um, I'm sure y'all have all read uh, the state's uh, opposition to Mr. Irish's application for fund C and the numerous procedural deficiencies and irregularities that we laid out in that document. Today, I want to use my time to talk to you about how the contempt that Daniel Irish has shown for you and board members for this entire process and for the Roland family should persuade you to convince you to deny him an opportunity for a full clemency hearing. Please do not ever give him the opportunity to convince someone else to one day let him. This is the first page of your the board's application. And I highlighted a sentence that says, each question must be answered fully, truthfully, and accurately. Mr. Irish doesn't know the meaning of those quotes. If you look at his answer to question number 12, in your own words, and that's from the application, in your own words, describe your involvement in the crime. I would hope that that's where we would see um, Mr. Irish owning up to what he did, to, to taking some responsibility and possibly expressing some remorse. And you know what we got? We got a verbatim quote from the Louisiana Supreme Court opinion on the right of view. And that was it. The what of that was in Daniel Irish's own words, nothing. Not only that, when your clemency investigator contacted him at Angola and asked him the same thing, Mr. Irish declined to answer. That after talking to counsel, I'm not gonna answer this question. And you know why? Mr. Irish can't answer that question fully, truthfully, and accurately because Mr. Irish cannot and will not accept responsibility for what he did to us for. He never has and he never will. You look at question 14, criminal history. It's another example of his contempt for you and this process. He completely omitted any mention of his felony convictions. They're not listed on there. You see hot checks, you see traffic. He, he left those out. Now, when the clemency investigator interviewed him from Angola and confronted him with this, oh yeah, I was convicted of that, but I didn't really do it. I was taking the charge from my brother and somebody else. Once again, that's not a full, truthful, and accurate answer, and he is not taking responsibility for what he has done. Again, in his application, describe the effect on the victim's family. And he gave a very short, very bland statement saying that Russ Rowland's children testified briefly at the trial but provided minimal information regarding the impact of their father's death. Well, legally, that's all they can do. What he left out was Emily Rowland's reaction to their investigator showing up unannounced at her house. She provided a letter, and we've included the text in our opposition that tells you exactly how she felt. And that was before this application was filed. Is any of that in their answers? No, it is not. In the application, they called on and on. Danny has been a model prisoner and a positive influence on death row. He wasted two years of the state's resources in his legal efforts to obtain pornography. Took it up to the First Circuit. Two years. Is this his, and I'm quoting here, constant advocacy on behalf of his fellow inmates? Then he ran a gambling operation from the cell and got caught and admitted to it. Is that an example of his positive influence on the death row prisoners? I submit to you, it's not. And again, by touting himself as a model prisoner and positive influence and completely omitting mention of those incidents, he has not provided you, the board, with full, truthful, and accurate information upon which to base your decision. And that segues into my next position. Can I have one more second? Look at the transcript attached to our opposition. This man is not intellectually disabled, not even remote, just real. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, once again, as I was doing previously, I want to thank everyone who showed up us. And, uh, um, you know, I, I hate to let put y'all through this again. Um, as she mentioned, that's right. You know, yeah, he was 18 when he committed the crime. He was 36 when he ran the gambling operation. Okay. He had five felony arrests while he was an adult. Um, due to his criminal activity, his uh, poor uh, arrest record, and his write-ups, and the nature of the offense, he served 27 years, and this was 100% premeditated. Uh, my vote is to deny. Thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Jackson. I'll reiterate again that the purpose of today's session is to determine whether or not someone is entitled to a PSD, not whether they're going to get to whether they're entitled to make their case. Mr. Irish was only 18 years of age. None of us at 18 and the same as we are at 17 or however age we might be today. You make decisions that are not right. You make decisions that are not even rational. How they ever thought they would get away with this. This shows the immaturity behind your action. He's only had five write-ups since he's been incarcerated. And according to our, our rules, our procedures that we look at, he meets the requirement for a hearing. This is not a determination today of whether there will be a recommendation for clemency. This is just a decision on whether or not he gets to make the case. And simply because someone gets a hearing does not mean they're going to get a recommendation of computation. Often, very often, we deny requests for funds after we have had a full hearing. There have been people who look good on paper until we have the full hearing and the board gets a better picture from the interview and the process that we go through and they get denied. There are other people who don't look as good on paper, but when you see them as an individual, you talk to them, you listen to them, you ask them probing questions, then you see that the paper picture is not an accurate representation of who they are. Our only task today is, does he meet the requirements that we generally follow in every case? to determine if somebody just moves to that hearing process. Having reviewed Mr. Irish's record or his the record before us, he was only 18 at the time of the offense. He only had 55 disciplinary write-ups and he meets the requirements of the step four. So my vote would be to grant him a hearing, granting clemency, but a hearing an opportunity to make his case. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I'd like to say this applicant is not in danger of being executed by the state of Louisiana. This applicant is applying for a commutation of sentence. That means he is asking this board to accept his application, be considered the commuting his sentence from death to life in prison without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension in sentence. What most people don't realize is that 
if he gets a recommendation for a hearing and gets a recommendation from the board and it is signed by the governor in five years and Mr. Ash is only 45 years old, by the time he's 50, 51 years old, can apply for a second fight at the app. And his sentence would be computed if successful and commuted to a number of years, he will become immediately parole eligible under Act 122 of the 2021 Louisiana State Legislature. And if he gets a recommendation from the board in a second bite of anything less than twice his sentence, he may be eligible for good time parole without a parole year. So this is all about him not, this is not about him being executed because he did not have an execution date. He's been a for 25 years. Exit, execution date has not been set. And if it is set, he has an avenue, he can ask for a reprieve from the governor or from this board. That is not paramount to this decision. This decision is whether we're going to commute from death to life without benefits. And then he knows there's a second step that he can take his five years, which ultimately might, might possibility lead to his release. So based on the egregious premeditated nature of this offense, he lured an individual who he was running Copied from to his home to rob and kill him. Expressed opposition from the victim's family. Expressed opposition from the Cattle Parish DA's office and the Cattle Parish Sheriff's office. Opposition from the Louisiana Attorney General's office and 65 other letters from friends classmates in the community at large, adamantly opposed accepting this application. My vote is to not accept the application. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Uh, I'd like to thank all the parties who uh, came here today to speak. Uh, you know, I listened to my colleagues all morning and, uh, you know, we have a responsibility to look at everything, to look at the, the, the crime that was committed, look at the person was at the time, look at what he's accomplished and where he is today. Um, you know, in my three and a half years on this pardon board, and I, and I, I feel an obligation just to say this, um, I have seen some egregious crimes many of which did not get the death penalty. And oftentimes it depends on where you commit the crime and who the prosecutor is as to whether or not you get the death penalty. The case before us today is for an application to have a hearing to determine whether or not this inmate deserves a hearing to put on a case for clemency. While I understand all of the opposition, uh, I do understand that my vote today would be to grant the application for a hearing, not to release him, but to grant an application uh, for a hearing. So my vote today would be to grant, uh, two votes to deny, two votes to grant. Ultimately, the decision is to deny the application. Mm -hmm. Well, there you have it. There you have it. You know, the contrast between the victim speaking 
and the one supporting this this monster it's so it's so vividly clear it's so obvious to me at least the difference it's like one is is in pain and is and what they say is like it's just so raw and I'm thinking of the words versus like the spiritual advisor that came up. What audacity to say what she said. What complete the words that I can think of just it she 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 brings up justice is doing God's will. Love is to seek and offer compassion. Only a humble soul understands the mercy of God. What are you implying by saying that? Are you implying that the victims don't have a humble soul? Are you implying that the victims wanting him to just be wiped off this earth so that they can finally live in a little bit of peace means that they don't have a humble soul? How dare you? It's, it's frankly just sickening. I don't understand how, how, how you can interpret what it is that she said. So do the only justice, God's justice. I love the response that came back when he said, you want to bring the Bible into this? Okay. An eye for an eye. Was it an ear for an ear, a leg for a leg, and all, whatever. Yeah, I was like, touche. You know, there's something that these supporters have in common. There is something rotten. And it's funny, even the attorney, and the attorney's doing what attorneys do, right? But it, it's it's almost comical to me when you hear him bring up the law between the age of 18 and 17. You know, he had just turned 18. They have to draw a line somewhere. And it's like, you know... We see so many cases where the person is like five days away from turning 18 and he falls under the under 18 and that's why he gets, an, you know, uh, his sentence commuted. And and it's like you just want to keep stretching it. It's like, well, he was 19, which is almost 18, which is almost 17. And then they even bring up the thing where he has a low IQ and we read about that. And I, and I'm thinking, you know, he's got a low IQ, like maybe he's, and they're like, he was 18, but he had the IQ of a 14 or 15 year old. And it's like, um, what? That's not really like, I'm expecting them to say six years old, eight years old. So he was 18 and he had the IQ of someone four years younger. Wow. I mean, I bet you can pick out of every 118 year olds, probably 30 of them have the similar IQs. Depending on who does the testing, right? And who's uh, who's behind the testing, right? Probably going to have three different results from three different testers. And then you hear about that he literally spent two years suing the system so that he can have his pornography. And they're sitting here talking about this, trying to like make him up to be this prince. He comes to a Bible class and he's so, he brings his Bible and he asks great questions. You hear the son speak, and that was just the truth there. And I, to me, that just sums it up.
you hear his pain, you hear him imagine because his son is the age that he was and what his father must have been feeling and thinking. And he says he just wants this to stop. He just wants this to go away. And then you hear the fallacies of really the lies of, 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 of the ones that are for him and, and like his attorney. And it's he's being in Angola for life is a terrible sentence. But Mr. O'Shea stated what what is the truth. It's the truth granting him a commutation, granting him a hearing. If commuted, he will have the opportunity to go free. He will have parole every several years until a parole board frees him. You can't participate in these hearings and attempt to deny the truth of the matter. And I've seen these hearings, and if you want to see more of them, let me know and we can do them. Uh, it's, but what is common in, is that in many of the cases, the ones advocating for them to be taken off the death row completely ignore the fact that if taken off the death row, they will have a chance of, of becoming free. They just ignore it. They pretend it doesn't exist because they don't like that reality. They don't. It doesn't fit into their narrative, and it's just bizarre. Now, the idea that Miss Jackson and Mr. Mirabella voted for him to have a right to have a hearing, it's quite interesting. But Miss Jackson, I believe, could be wrong. I mean, there might be an exception. I haven't seen all of them, but I believe she was voted across the board that they all should have a right to have a hearing because it was her belief that they should all have a right to have a hearing and then get denied at a hearing. That's just her ground. That's just her belief on it. I don't agree with her because of the pain that it causes the victims. Um, why Mr. Mirabella voted, I don't know. She's, she's, you know, at that point, it had to be unanimous. At that point, you know, he knew it was denied anyway, so maybe he's just, but who knows. And... This has been very controversial, of course. Um, in Louisiana, there have been a lot of these different hearings. Now, here's <laughs> I'm trying to here's something interesting Richard showed me that someone wrote. My official my Bossier blog in Bossier, North Louisiana. This is in 2000. And so since 2007, we've been holding local people, events, and politicians. Go. I'm not sure what. What I'm reading there. Hold on. Um, why is he still alive? Someone wrote this blog post. This was written in 2010. The Times reported this morning that Danny Irish, who was on death row at Angola for a Cato Parish murder that occurred in 1996, was denied pornography in a lawsuit that he had filed. Danny Sue claimed that it was educational material. Danny was looking for pen pals a few years ago on the internet. Here's Danny. He's happy to meet you. I'm sure he has plenty of pen pals. He goes on to state in his blog, why is he allowed to file a frivolous lawsuit for such as seeking pornography? Why is he allowed to use the internet? These are privileges that should be considered basic rights. He has a right to due process and received it. That included mandated appeal of a sentence. Beyond that, he, we owe him nothing. About the only right that the Lowen family has left is to take flowers to the cemetery and place it on the grave. And I just, it, it's funny how they ignore the fact that he literally was filing these frivolous lawsuits and he hasn't shown remorse and he hasn't, like you heard the responses of what he put in. Was it the DA that said it? I mean, she was great. You heard the responses of what he put in in his application. He did copy-paste of what the court... He showed no remorse. 
nothing. He was an insult to the system and even providing information for this application. I don't want to respond. Then his daughter, his daughter shows his daughter shows up at the victim's daughter house and pretends to be like someone who she's not to try to manipulate them. And then she calls the family the day before this hearing. Of course, he can't prove that he has anything to do with it, but huh. I mean, the guy is just. There is what redeeming factors have you seen in, in from everything that you have heard? And it just, again, makes me sick when I have to hear the people supporting him, because, you know, when they're supporting him, what, what are they doing it for? Like Mr. O'Shea said, he doesn't even have a date to be sentenced. And once it is given that date, then he will have all of the different appeals, blah, 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 that he can drag it through the courts for who knows how lo much longer. But to advocate for him now, when the victims are clearly in raw pain to just disregard their pain, to disregard all of the victim's pain, to benefit one man, to benefit one man so that he can have a little bit more of a comfortable life, that sounds like justice to you? Make that make sense. Articulate that. You can't. You can't, not in my opinion. And with that, I'll let you go.